Information discussed in this podcast may be sensitive in nature to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Mike Negrete was an excellent musician known for his trumpet skills and his talent on my personal favorite, the steel drums. In 1999, Mike was a freshman at UCLA on a music scholarship with so much going for him. College years are supposed to be about growing up, having some fun, hopefully not too much fun, making friends and learning about life. Mike was doing all of this. On December 10th, 1999, Mike and some friends went to a party. Pretty normal thing for college students to do, right? At some time in the early morning hours, Mike and his roommate returned to their dorm room in Dykstra Hall. The roommate went to bed, but Mike stayed up playing video games online with another friend who actually lived right down the hall in the dorm. Around 4.30 a.m., their game ended, and Mike went to congratulate his friend on winning the game. Mike saw his friend and then turned around and headed back to his own dorm for the night. But that would be the last time anyone saw or heard from Mike. Where is Michael William Negrete? You'd think on a college campus, it would be hard to disappear. Thousands of students milling about, generally at all hours. How does one just vanish? Never to be found. Makes no sense. So the first college student we are covering today is the story and the case of Michael Negrete. Michael generally went by Mike to everyone who knew him. So that's what I'll be calling him from here on out. Mike Williams Negrete was born on March 25, 1982. He grew up with his parents in San Diego, California, along with two younger brothers. Mike was always musically talented, and that talent earned him a scholarship to UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles. In August of 1999, Mike started his freshman year and lived on campus in Dykstra Hall. On December 10th, Everyone was getting ready for finals the upcoming week, and then winter break. That evening, there were a lot of parties around campus, maybe more than most other weekends, because it was kind of a last hurrah. Mike went to a party with his friends and made his way back to his dorm room in the early morning hours. His roommate went to sleep, but Mike wasn't ready to. He stayed awake and played a game online with a friend, a friend who was actually in the same dorm, but just lived right down the hall. Just after 4 a.m., Mike and his friend ended their game. Mike had lost, and he walked down the hall to congratulate his friend on the win. He stayed for a few minutes, and then around 4.30 p.m., Mike headed back to his own dorm room, finally ready to call it a night, or so everyone thought. The next morning, Mike's roommate woke up and saw that Mike wasn't there. He thought it was odd knowing that Mike had stayed up late playing games. He figured Mike would probably sleep half the day away. And he also noticed that Mike had left his wallet and his keys behind on the desk. Even stranger, where would he go without those items? But the roommate figured Mike just must have gone somewhere and he'd probably see him later. Your first instinct isn't to think that someone went missing, especially a college roommate. Later that night, Mike still hadn't come back to the dorm room and he was finally reported missing. Authorities did start looking for Mike. His parents in San Diego were contacted and a full search began. First, detectives started questioning everyone in the dorm, including the roommate and of course the friend down the hall. 
The friend said that Mike had left his room around 4.30 a.m., and he had believed that Mike was going back to his room and going to bed. They questioned everyone in the dorm building also, Dykstra Hall, but no one recalled seeing Mike at all around 4.30. Eventually, search dogs were brought in, and they were actually able to track Mike's scent across campus to a bus stop about a mile away where the scent ended. Now, Mike didn't have a car on campus, so that would make sense that he would take the bus somewhere. But at 4.30 a.m., and no one had seen him if he had been walking there to that bus stop. Plus, where would he be going? It's also unclear, since Mike lived on campus, of course, and spent a lot of time there, if the dogs had tracked a recent scent. Some people wondered if perhaps they were tracking an old scent, since Mike did live there, the campus the dorm room, maybe he had taken that bus before. Was that actually a scent from December 10th and 11th? Mike was from San Diego and living at UCLA in Los Angeles. Where did he need to go on the night of December 10th? After partying all night and playing video games until 4 a.m.? Mike's background was thoroughly looked into, and even after talking to friends and family, Nothing was found to lead anyone to believe that Mike had some sort of secret life or was hiding something or something else was going on that could have been dangerous or troublesome to Mike. Mike himself was also not troubled, not that anyone knew anyway. So would he have just left on his own and left behind his keys and his wallet and most, if not all, of his personal belongings right before final exams? The searches and investigation turned up nothing, as far as the public knew. They searched construction sites on campus. They searched garbage dumpsters. Nothing was found. The campus of UCLA is located on the west side of Los Angeles, surrounded by affluent neighborhoods, but also not far from the hills and valleys of Topanga Canyon State Park, Red Rock Canyon Mountains, and the Santa Monica Mountain region. It's actually also just six to seven miles to Santa Monica Beach in the Pacific Ocean. Mike didn't have a car, so could he have taken the bus somewhere? Did he leave the area to go meet with someone? Or was he picked up by someone, either a pre-planned meeting or something that happened spur of the moment? In 1999, UCLA had an enrollment of 30,000 students. While populated, it was also 4.30 in the morning when Mike was last seen. Certainly a higher probability Mike could have left the area willingly or unwillingly without being seen. Seven months after his disappearance, police released a sketch of a man that had possibly been seen in the dorm in those early morning hours, the same hours in which Mike vanished. The man was described as Caucasian, possibly mid-30s, and it's really unclear why it took seven months for this information to come out. Some have said that the student or students that reported seeing this man did report it to law enforcement right away, but they weren't taken seriously. Others have said that police were probably keeping this information hush-hush until they finally decided to release it for possible leads. Law enforcement never really clarified why it took seven months to release that sketch. Now here's where things get interesting. A family friend of the Negrites, a man by the name of Damon Van Dam, resembled that sketch quite a bit. This man also admitted to being in the Los Angeles area at the time of Mike's disappearance, but denied being near the campus. Damon Van Dam also lived in San Diego, so it's unclear if he gave a reason for why he was in Los Angeles. Of course, this was before the time of tracking cell phones. Possibility of tracking a cell phone isn't really an option here, so we really don't know if we can prove or disprove Damon Van Dam's statements as to where he was. Damon Van Dam also admitted to being into sex and drug parties, along with his wife. At the same time, some information started coming out that Mike might have been experimenting with ecstasy. So in 
So people started talking about this Damon Van Dam, but at no point did he ever become an official person of interest or a suspect. There was virtually no trail for the police to follow, few leads that led to anything substantial, and still no sign of Mike Negrete anywhere, even months and months after he vanished. Another strange and terribly tragic twist in this story would come in 2002. Damon Van Dam's seven-year-old daughter was murdered. A neighbor would be tried and convicted of this heinous, horrible crime. And during that investigation, Van Dam's character once again came into question. Again, it was brought up that he was into these sex and drug raves and parties. And in fact, the night his daughter was murdered, he was doing drugs and had women in the house. But Van Dam admitted to only using marijuana that night, said they didn't do anything else. And really, none of that, of course, gives the neighbor who was convicted any more reason for doing what he did. There is no excuse. I don't care if a crazy sex and drug fueled party was happening. In one strange interview that Van Dam did with a radio host, he made a strange comment that people latched onto. He voluntarily said, without being asked, quote, It is strange that I was in Los Angeles when Mike Negrete disappeared, and I was in Florida when Adam Walsh disappeared. End quote. Why did he even bring that up if he wasn't prompted or asked? Other than all of these odd circumstances, There was nothing concrete or really nothing of any substance pointing to Van Damme as a person of interest. Mike's younger brother later came out and said that he knew Mike had started dabbling with ecstasy, and he thinks that Mike probably left the dorm that night in search of some or with plans to meet up with someone. And in the course of doing that, met with trouble, likely foul play. Police have also said they suspect foul play, if only because Mike left behind everything. His social security number hasn't been used, bank accounts have not been touched, and he had no reason to leave on his own or disappear, or even possibly harm himself or commit suicide. No one believed that. Whatever he was up to that night, it seems no one close to Mike knew about it, at least that they have fessed up to. And detectives have said that everyone close to Mike seemed very cooperative and forthcoming with information. So what happened at 4.30 a.m. to UCLA freshman Mike Negrete? Mike is described as a Caucasian male, about 5 foot 8 inches tall, and weighing around 130 pounds when he was last seen in December of 1999. He was 18 years old and would today be 41 years old. He was known to be wearing a blue plaid shirt, khaki shorts, and white canvas tennis shoes. Anyone with any information is asked to call the UCLA Police Department at 310-825-1491 or the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department at 323-890-5500. Also, the man in the police sketch is described as approximately 35 years old in 1999, about five foot seven to five foot eight inches tall with a heavy build. He was wearing a shiny gray jacket with a turquoise colored design. Absolutely scary that a young man can vanish from a college campus without a trace for so many years. I do hope his case can continue to be talked about and hopefully soon his family and friends can have answers. There is a Facebook group set up for him. Never forget Mike Negrete. It is still active to this day and helps keep his name out there. Thank you all so much for listening to Mike's story today. We will be back again very soon with another Unsolved Missing Persons episode. And until then, stay safe and hug your loved ones.